Okay, good morning and welcome to uh, Flight 2068. I feel like we've just boarded an aircraft. Um, I also feel like I should do the safety demonstration. Underneath your seats in the event of emergency is a life vest. I encourage you to put that on. It has a, uh, a whistle to attract <laughs> attention and, and a light in case you have challenges. And in the event of an emergency, the emergency exit lights will uh, light up and there are exits over here, here and here. So I just encourage you to, to head off across to those. So next uh, 90 minutes, we're going to be talking about modern switching uh, operations with Cisco DNA Center. Uh, you've got two of us today, roughly breaking this into to half. So both of us are very similar in some ways, yet very different for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, we, we, we come from different countries. We've spent pretty much the same amount of time at Cisco. We have fairly similar roles. And we also contribute back quite a lot in terms of content. So you've probably seen some of our content blogs, YouTube videos, etc. And we've both been presenting at Cisco Live for a long period of time. In fact, we've been involved in network automation for nearly 20 years between us. So both of us started working with the enterprise network uh, automation solutions back before it was um, three versions ago, back in Milan, for those of you around back then. And we both like traveling, we both like physical activities, um, and we both in really enjoy spending time with you uh, at events like this. So thanks very much, and uh, we'll get into the session. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to go through the life cycle of a, a switch, and we're going to look at day zero, day one, day two, and day n operations of the switching infrastructure. Before I get started, how many people have Cisco DNA Center in their environment? Nice. How many of you are using it for switching? Nice. Um, the reason that we wanted to put this session together is that many people are, are focused around the wireless use cases, yet there's a lot that we've done around wired and switching over the last couple of years to, to make that even better. So I wanted to start off with my favorite topic, something that I'm very passionate about, which is plug and play. How many people are using plug and play? Awesome. For switching? Awesome. OK, who would like to come up and do this section? Anyone? I'm not shy. OK, so in terms of plug and play, what are we trying to do? Trying to get the device onto the network without having to touch it. Three things that are required. A device that has an agent in it that knows what it's doing. Something to communicate to, which in this case is Cisco DNA Center. And then a funky protocol that exists between the two to make sure that they can communicate in a secure way. In terms of the challenge that you have with plug and play, number one thing that you need to do is to solve the challenge of discovery. You plug the device in, how does it find out what to talk to? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's DHCP. And we use either option 43 or DNS to resolve uh, a name to, to connect to to get that initial contact. Now, for those of you who are in an environment where DHCP is not possible, it is possible to use a USB bootstrap that has absolute minimal piece of config on it, no credentials, nothing. All you need to do is to have an IP address, a route, and you have to have a little profile that says where DNA Center is, either by IP address or name. Pretty simple. I'm not going to go through this because I'm assuming many people are familiar with it. This is a reference slide on option 43. Uh, a couple of different ways you can do it. You can do it on Linux as well. We don't really care. And I'm also not really going to cover this slide, which is around the provisioning flows. So there are two ways that you can manage devices connecting to DNA Center. There's what's called the unclaimed workflow, where you let the device boot up, discover it, and then you have to do something. Or if you know about the device in advance and its serial number, you can put in a, an entry in DNA Center for the device, mapping it to a configuration and uh, potentially an image that you want to upgrade it to. So pretty simple. Switching. How many people are using stacks? How many people tried using plug and play with stacks uh, in APKM? Yeah? was a little bit painful because you had to wait for switches to boot up. So we do have full stacking support. Uh, the nice thing about this is that you can either 
tell DNA Center in advance that the device is a stack, or if it discovers the device, it'll work out that it's a stack. And stacking support enables a couple of different things. The first thing it does is it does a software upgrade of the stack and all of the stack members. The second thing that it does, which is really important, is stack renumbering. Why does that matter? What is the importance of the stack member number in an iOS config? Well, how are interfaces defined? Gigabit Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 3. What is the one? Stack member number, right? So if I have a stack of four switches, stack member number four will be gigabit ethernet one slash zero slash three. Sorry, four slash zero slash three. Now, the implication of this is if you're pushing a configuration down, you really need to know which is switch one, which is switch four. What happens when a switch stack boots up? It's random in terms of those member numbers. And the reason I made the joke about APKM was that in those days, you had to boot a switch, wait two minutes, boot the next switch, wait two minutes, boot the next switch, wait two minutes. Stack of eight switches, not a lot of fun. Manual intervention, not a lot of fun. So because of that, we added an ability in DNA Center to do a, a stack member renumbering. Now, there is a caveat here. What you need to do is you need to make sure that you have your stacks cabled in a, in a circle, in a loop. So you need to have all of those cables in a loop. And then based on that, we can work out the order of the stack, which one is on top. You provide that serial number, and then it will renumber. And whichever serial number you give it will be stack one. And then you'll get all of the member numbers appropriately. Now, there are two different ways of wiring, clockwise and anti-clockwise. Initially, we only supported one. Now we support two, so you can choose which way your stack is numbered. If you get that wrong, you'll essentially end up with bottom to top instead of top to bottom. Just make sure you get that right. OK, another topic that I'm very passionate about is that when you plug a switch in, how many people are using VLAN 1 as their management interface, uh, not using Ether Channel or any port aggregation, and just have a single link down to a, an edge switch. Anyone? No? Really? Yeah, that's not the way that you really deploy switches, right? When you deploy a switch in most production environments, there will be some networking intricacy that is going on. So this very simple example, which is VLAN 1, that just works. Um, you can do it that way, but that is a really simple and naive use case. And you can convert that. DHCP address to a static address, that's pretty easy to do. And you, what you're able to do is to define a template to, to do that. So the way that you understand this is that um, the configuration on the left-hand side is what happens by default. So that's the way that the switch will boot up. The configuration is down the bottom. After I apply that configuration, which DNA Center will do, I end up with the configuration on the right. So before and after. That's the simple use case. Nobody does that but it's just there for reference. Now, the more common use case is that you want to use a management VLAN, VLAN 15 in this case. Now, what we have done is we've got a protocol inside the switches that allows it to negotiate the management VLAN. There's a PNP startup VLAN command you run on the upstream switch, and that will automatically create the SVI. It will automatically add a IP D, uh, address DHCP on the downstream switch. Uh, if you're trunking, uh, it will automatically put switch port mode trunk on, so it works that out as well, which is pretty obvious if you're going to be using uh, VLANs. And then what you can do on the uh, management VLAN, you can give it a static IP address, an IP route, and you're good to go. So that's a more sophisticated use case. And then the final use case is that you're doing trunking, management VLAN, and you're doing port channels. Well, as of 1612, we can take that into account as well. So we're able to work out that the upstream device has got a port channel running. We'll create the port channel on the downstream. You can then add the extra interfaces if you want to, um, or you probably should add the extra interfaces in the configuration that you push, and that port channel will, will come up. There was a workaround. Uh, it was a little bit ugly before, but this is supported natively. We also support non-native VLAN 1. That all works. So in later versions of code, and I'm assuming 
everybody is running later than 1612, all of that stuff gets, gets taken care of for you. OK, one of the common questions I get asked is about changing interfaces. So what happens if I want to move from one VLAN to another? What happens if I want to move from the VLAN to a separate VRF on the switch? All of that stuff can happen inside the config that you push from DNA Center. And the reason that that works is that the plug and play protocol initiates from the device to DNA Center. So everything comes from the device. What's the implication of that? Well, if I change the IP address, change the VLAN, change whatever the device uses to communicate to v DNA Center, DNA Center is going to see that as being the source IP address, right? So nothing is being pushed down from DNA Center to the device. The device is asking DNA Center what it should do. What should I do next? Download this image, upgrade code. What should I do next? You should install the, um, this particular configuration. And then once it's done that, the final step is DNA Center will add it to the inventory based on the last IP address that the device used to connect to it which means that you can switch over IP addresses really easily. Now, there is one thing you need to know. There's the IP HTTP client source interface command that needs to go in to tell the device which interface to use to make that HTTP connection to DNA Center. So that's all you need to do in the template that you push down if you happen to change the interface. Um, troubleshooting, lots of questions about troubleshooting. The brief guide is think about it as being an IP problem initially until the device is on to DNA Center. Lots of people tell me that DNAC's not working, plug and play is broken. I ask them if the device has an IP address of reachability, and the answer is no. Well, not a DNAC problem, right? Standard networking. But some little tips to go through here. OK. Management ports are supported. So yes, management ports are in a separate VRF. Everything works just fine. We've done a lot of work to make sure that that works. OK, next common question. In DNA Center, there are two types of templates. There's day zero and day n. Leela's going to talk about day one operations and templates and template compliance, et cetera. Just want to clear something up here. The basic difference between them, and if you ever get a trivia question around what is the difference between day zero and day n, your answer is push versus pull. Repeat, push, pull. Quiet, that's OK. But that's the way that you remember. Now, there's some implications of this. Because day zero is a pull from DNA Center to the device, I can change the IP address of the device, and everything is OK. But I get the config in one hit. So there are some restrictions around doing that. The way that day n works is that each line of the config is pushed down to the device, and it checks to see that, that that config is OK. Now, the implication of that is if you try to change management IP addresses and you lose reachability, template's going to fail. And it's quite messy to get around that. So you don't want to be doing that. Um, the other challenge around this is that you can have interactive commands when you're pushing things down. So if you have a command that requires interaction, like you know, deleting a certificate, for example, there's a bunch of commands that will prompt you for a yes, no. You can those are supported in the day end templates where you're connecting to the device and you're monitoring what the device says in response. How many people have used templating in DNA Center? OK. How many people use Velocity, Ginger? OK, roughly 50-50 mix. OK, so Velocity came from Prime Infrastructure. Um, we also support Ginger in the latest versions. A template can be one of two things. It can be what I call a dumb template, which is just a bunch of CLI commands that you're pushing down. It doesn't matter which language you use for that. You're not taking advantage of the templating language. If you want to do funky things like variables, if you want to do things like if commands, if you want to do things like for loops, um, then you need to choose a language, and there are some structures that you can use to take it, uh, into account those programming constructs. So 
one of the first differences is variables. Um, one of the things that you might want to do is you might want to have a loopback interface, and you might want to give it a variable. Uh, that's very easy to do. So what I wanted to do is, uh, how many people like PowerPoint? Anyone? I thought I'd just do a video demo instead to show you the concept of what I want to get across, because it's probably a little bit easier. The slides are there as reference, so you've got them to take away. But I just want to show you um, how the template stuff works. So one of the things that you need to take into account here is that this is the latest code. It's the 235 code. It's going to look a little bit different to the way that the UI works in uh, the slides. Now, the reason I did that is that 235 is not technically available to you. So if you go home and you want to do this, at least the slides will match the, the current user interface. But it has changed a little bit. It's just tweaks in terms of what's available where. It's not too much different. So these are a couple of little uh, templates that I've got. The first one is the most naive uh, template that you can create. It's called uh, variable, I think. And that's just defining a single variable. So dollar loopback is a variable. Now, this is not really a proper template, because typically you would do something with this. It would be interface, you know, dollar loopback if it was the name of the interface, and then IP address, dollar loopback IP address. But you get the idea. The point behind this is that variables um, can be not a variable. Now, that sounds stupid, doesn't it? I said variables cannot, can be not a variable. Why is that? Well, in velocity, a variable starts with dollar. How many people have looked at an encrypted password? What's in an encrypted password, potentially? Usually, given the size of the string, you've got a pretty good probability of having a dollar there. So it is possible to mark something as not a variable. So if your template happens to contain an encrypted password, as an example, or anything else that has the, the dollar sign in it, you can mark that as not a variable and just ignore it. The other thing about templates, uh, sorry, variables, is that they can be, uh, they have a type. So it can be a string. Uh, it can be uh, an IP address. It can be an integer. So that's something that you need to, to be careful of. You can specify a bunch of different things, like the maximum number of um, characters. You can specify multiple inputs. There's a range of different things that you can specify around variables. But that's just the, the simplest use case. One of the other things that we do is we give you access to system variables. So you're probably wondering what a system variable is. Now, this is data or information that DNA Center has about the device or the site. Now, the reason you might want to do this is it allows you to introspect the device from the template. And what I mean by that is inside the template, you have the ability to understand a bit about the device. For example, uh, you can look at characteristics of the inventory of the device. So you can see the serial number of it or the model number of it. What's encoded often in the model number? Number of interfaces, right? So if you wanted to have a clever template that was applicable to a 24 or 48 port switch, you could take that variable and then do something with it, strip off the, the number of interfaces, and you would have an idea of the maximum number of interfaces on a, on a port. Um, the other thing that you're able to do, sorry, number of interfaces on a device. The other thing that you're able to do is you're able to introspect interfaces themselves, and that will give you all of the attributes of an interface, including its name. And I'm going to show you a simple example of, of how you can use a template and do something based on port name. So a lot of work that we've done around that. Now, if I look at the, um, the interfaces bound template, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define a variable called dollar interfaces. And I have you know, four interface, dollar interface and dollar interfaces do something. And essentially what that's going to do is for every interface I provide to the device, it's going to do something to it. It could be uh, give it a VLAN. It could be shut it down. It could be anything I want. 
Now, this variable is going to be bound to a source. So it's not something that I'm going to provide input to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bind it to a source, which is one of those implicit variables, sorry, one of those system variables in DNA Center. And in this case, I'm binding it to the inventory. Uh, the entity is interface, and the attribute is port name. So what I'm saying is, and it's multi-select. So this is saying that I can get access to multiple interfaces uh, as part of the inventory, and it's going to give me the attribute port name. So essentially what it's going to pass into the template is a list of interface names for, that I've selected from the user interface. One of the other things that we've done in uh, DNA Center is that we have, I'm just showing you how that happens. You can add other attributes if you want to. You've got the concept of simulation, which allows you to test out how that template is going to work. So you give it a name, you select a device, and then you can notice here what's happened is because I bound that interface, I bound that variable to the interface's uh, system variable, I can pick and choose a number of interfaces, and those are going to be passed into my template. So in this case, I pass those in, I run it, and you saw my template was very simple. All it did was just shut it down. Now, that's a trivial example. It could be whatever you want, but I just wanted to make the point that it's, it's an example. Now, the final um, thing that I wanted to show you is that you can do what's called an implicit binding. And the reason that you might want to do an implicit binding is that it means that there is no longer a selection process. So the special variable dollar under, double underscore interface is going to give me all of the interfaces on a given device. So if I wanted to do something on all of the interfaces, then that would be a way that I could do that. Now, you're probably wondering why I would do that. Well, the reason I would do that typically is that I've got some logic that's going to pick out the interfaces that I want to, to act on. So I just want to pass it all to the template. The template is going to be smart enough to work out out of all those interfaces which ones are important and which ones aren't. And it means I don't have to have any user input. So when I look at the variables, there is no variables. Because the one that I defined is implicit. But when I go to the simulation, all I need to do is just select a device, and it's going to get all of the interfaces, and it's going to do whatever I said to all of the interfaces. Now, shutting them all down is a pretty silly thing to do, but it's just to illustrate the point. OK, so we've covered all of this. But what I wanted to give you is a real example. So this is a real example that is taking in all of the interfaces. It's looking for any interface that is physical, so not a SVI. It's looking for any interface that is in access mode. And it's looking to see if there's a description that matches the keyword LAN, or the regular expression LAN. And if that LAN um, string is not present, it's going to add it to the description and push that out. Now, the reason that we needed this was in uh, earlier versions of code, if you wanted to do application visibility, you had to put the LAN keyword into the description of the access port. So if you're running SDA, for example, and you wanted to do this, then that was a really good way of just creating a template that would automatically um, add the LAN keyword to any interfaces that didn't have it. And it would preserve the existing description. One way I could do it is I could just push LAN out as the the description, but what it's doing is it's taking the existing description that's there and it's putting the LAN keyword at the end of it. So it's, and I don't want to have LAN, 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 LAN every time I run it, so it makes sure that the LAN keyword doesn't exist first and it only adds it if in the case that it doesn't have it. OK, uh, just to finish up, templates need to be committed, um, versioning history. And the other thing that we have changed is that in 2.3.5, you can actually apply a template directly to a device. So that's something that we have changed, because typically templates are associated with a network profile. Uh, in 2.3.5, we've given you the ability to push a template to any device without having to go through that provisioning process. So that's all in terms of templates. Going to hand across to Leela now, who's going to talk some more about day one operations. U5? Yeah. Yep. 
There we go. Oh, okay. Let me move a little bit here so I can actually see. Fantastic. So Adam covered day zero onboarding. Now let's cover day one. And day one means getting devices into inventory. Obviously, not everything is going to be zero touch onboarding for newer devices. We have brownfield devices, switches that we want to onboard in DNA Center. So I wanted to summarize the workflow of onboarding existing devices in your network. And in the next slides, I'm going to show you exactly what type of configuration is being pushed to the network devices in each of these steps. So we can onboard devices using discovery, obviously using PMP. Uh, anyone has Prime? That here, so if you decide to migrate Prime to DNA Center, that's called Prime Migration, and it will go through a very similar workflow. So in the end, we discover the devices, and after that, what happens is what we call inventory collection. So DNA Center will go into the device and grab all the configuration required and store the configuration in internal databases. Then the magic happens. How many of you are familiar with device controllability? So device, DNA Center does a lot of things. So we get health information. We can do compliance. We obviously do automation. We need to know when there's a config change. How do we know all these things? Because we are leveraging features that are part of the switches, or wireless LAN controllers, but in this, uh, in this session, it's about switches. So in order to leverage all those features, we need to configure them. And obviously, if we are in the automation world, we will not ask you to go in and configure all those features manually. We are automating all that. And that umbrella we call device controllability. So in a nutshell, and I'll show you more a little bit later, we will automatically configure syslog and SNMP traps and streaming telemetry, all the features that we need for DNA Center to do its job. And that happens the moment you assign a device to a site. And I'll show you that a little bit later. On top of that, so with that you will get device health and client health automatically. You don't need to do anything. If you want to get application visibility, then there's an option to, and it's optional, for you to enable telemetry. So once you enable telemetry, that is going to push NetFlow information into the device so that we can start capturing application data. And then optionally, you can take things a step further and go in and configure the device with your own configurations. And with that, we use network settings, and we use what we call uh, network profiles with templates. And I'm going to augment on what Adam already covered for template, in my case, for day N. OK, so let's go back. We talked about device controllability. Device controllability is really recommended. If we don't get all this information from the network devices, we will not be able to do our job, meaning DNA Center. So it's recommended that you have all the defaults there, but there's a level of customization that you can do. For example, here, so these are all the features that we configure in switches, and you can customize in the telemetry tab. For example, we have here SNMP traps. We do want to get SNMP traps, so leaving the option of sending all those traps from the device to DNA Center is recommended. If we don't receive the traps, we will not get updated information. However, if you do require SNMP traps being sent to another destination, we can can add a second SNMP server here. Again, same thing with syslog. There are options for customization. Same thing for IP device tracking, NetFlow, et cetera. So there is a level of customization there. So now let's go through the same workflow I mentioned before, but I'm going to give you the commands that we are pushing to the device. Those commands are really for reference because the commands really depend on the version of the device, the iOS XE, and the version of DNA Center. Every time we change the version of DNA Center, we might be enhancing and adding features, which means that we might be making configuration changes to the device controllability, so don't copy and paste those uh, commands because it might not work in your environment. So here is the discovery. How many of you tested discovery? How many of you already onboarded devices into your, your DNA centers? 
So this is um, the discovery window, many options for discovery. We can do IP range and CDP and LLDP. But once we enter those uh, details, the devices are going to show up in the inventory. We are already collecting all the data from the devices. And the devices are going to be put in an unassigned bucket. So we don't know what, um, what site that, devi that device belongs to. In that uh, process of discovery, we are going to still push minimum configuration to the device if necessary. What is the configuration? If you don't have your SNMP communities, we are going to push them. We do need SNMP information. And if you don't have your netconfyang command in the device, it's going to be pushed as well. We are moving to doing more and more things. We do still use SSH to connect to the device, but whenever possible, we use netconf over SSH as well. So that is going to be pushed in this step, very minimum. Then we're going to assign the device to a site. And this is, again, where the magic happens. All our device controllability features are going to be pushed. And for that, we are going to use the defaults or, and or any customizations that you might have made. So first, we're going to get a window. So pay attention when you assign the device to site, where it says, hey, device controllability is enabled. So it's there. And then it's going to tell you a little bit of a summary of what, um, uh, on what features we are actually configuring. And again, this is a little bit of the reference, but I want it for you to have an idea. This is on my switch in the lab. So we see IP device. The order of the configuration is all out of whack because I compiled the, all the features in one slide. So for example, here we have all IP device tracking. Uh, there it is. We have the certificate, so obviously we are going to push certificates. We have syslog. We have SSH configuration. We have also a ton, and this is not comprehensive. We are pushing a ton of traps, again, that are important for us to understand what's going on. For, we are going to talk about compliance a little bit later on. How can we keep compliance config? For example, we have one trap that is a config trap. So if someone goes out and make an out-of-band change, the device is going to send a trap to DNA Center, and DNA Center knows, oh, I need to go and reread the config from that device so I can do compliance check and config drift. If I don't have that trap, I will not know that there was an out-of-band config change. And again, all this is configured automatically. And the last thing that we push is also uh, telemetry subscriptions. We've been adding telemetry subscriptions. Uh, in this case, I have the POE ones. We have a POE dashboard. And again, all that is available through these telemetry subscriptions. All that is device controllability. Next. Optional, if you want to get application visibility, we have the application experience dashboard. And the thing about application visibility is that it really depends on what type of device is sending the application data. And this is not a customizable. It depends on the device capabilities. So we really get the most from iOS XC routers and 9800 wireless LAN controllers. In the, and I know this is not the, the context of today but I need to give you the baseline. In that case, we will get what applications are being used, we get how much, we get delay, jitter, and packet loss. In the case of switches, we don't get the application experience, we get application visibility, which is we only get information on what applications are being used and how much. We don't get health information from switches. So how do we enable this? We, from the inventory, there's an option that says enable application telemetry. And when you do that, this is the, ta the type of configuration that is being pushed to the device. Next step, again, this is optional, is OK, now that everything is in the inventory, I have assurance I will see everything that Adam is going to cover in the next section. What if I want to provide configurations to the device? So if we are going to do that, we need to leverage a component that is called network profile. Anyone configure devices using DNA Center? So 
we know, whoever did this already, that network profile is a very big component of the provisioning workflow as well as site. Site is kind of the glue that puts everything together. So we already assigned the device to site, so we already did this. Every site has network settings, so if you want to configure your syslog server, if, sorry, your NTP server, if you want to configure your AAA server, if you want to configure your DNS, your DHCP, everything is done in a section that is called network settings. Network settings can be assigned at a global level or per site. So each site is going to have a whole bunch of network settings that you are going to define. So this is here. And the last thing that you can have is a network, um, is a network profile that for switches, for wireless is different, but for switches, it's going to be a bunch of templates. And that is optional. If you don't have templates, that's OK, too. And again, the templates are going to be, uh, are, are we are going to see that in the demo. We are going to have templates, and you can decide uh, what type of devices that templates are going to be applied to. You can, you can also tag them, so you have a lot of flexibility there. So the moment you provision, how is DNA Center to, going to pick up what's going to provision to the device? It's going to grab the device. It's going to take all the network settings associated to that side where the device belongs to, and then it's going to take all the templates for that device type on the network profile for that site. And we'll see that on the demo. So again, the site is going to glue all these components together, so you don't need to go in and manually tell DNA Central what to configure. All that is done beforehand. So again, a little bit of a summary here. We have the network settings for this site. Again, these are all the network settings that, I'm, that I provision for that device. I have an I need 200 l in my inventory. I have my templates here. In the templates are associated to the device type. So when we go into the provision workflow, only the 9200L templates are going to be picked up, not the templates for other device types. Then we are going to put that, um, that template into a network profile, and the network profile is going to be associated with a site. So when we go in and provision the device, everything, all the components that we just mentioned are going to be uh, provisioned. Again, we have the device information, we have all the network settings, device controllability is being shown here too, and then we have the templates that we are going to be pushing to that device. And again, this is a reference slide on all the commands that were pushed with my configuration for the 9200 switch. So now let's go into a demo. And for you guys on that side, I will be hiding here, but again, this is not on purpose. So we are going to, go, we are going to do the provisioning workflow, and we are going to go into inventory insights. So the first thing that you need to do if you're going to have templates is that you need to define your templates. We are not going to go into template language because already Adam covered that, but in my case, I have two very basic templates, one to assign a description to interfaces and the other to assign a VLAN 419. So once I'm done with my, the definition of the templates, I need to assign all those templates to a network profile, as I mentioned before. So in this case, I already have my network profile I have my onboarding templates, but in this case, we are using the day end templates. Those are the ones that are going to be pushed during the provisioning workflow. I have four templates. However, only two are related to a 9200L switch. So this is 9200L, 9200L. This one is 9300. So this one is not going to be picked up to provision a 9200L. And same thing with a stack member. I also have tags, so if you want to become more granular, not only device type, but any other, uh, for example, you might have switches with SDA and non-SDA, and you want to have other type of templates, you can, use, you can use the templates for that granularity. Then we assign the, temp the network profile to a site. In my case, the site is called T-Branch. 
now I already define all the components that are necessary to go in and provision the device. So I'm going to go into my inventory and select the device. In my case, I'm provisioning one device so that we can follow the configuration, but this is more interesting if you go in and provision a bulk number of devices, 100 devices at a time, that is going to be the more time saver as opposed to doing one. But for this exercise, one is okay. So first step is to assign the device to site. Usually there's nothing to do there because we already assigned the device to site. But this is where the advanced configuration comes from, and uh, in our case, those are the variables. If you're, the templates, if your templates have variables, this is where we are going to instantiate those variables. The, before doing that, this, there's an option here if, that it says, if we already went through the provisioning workflow and we already provisioned the templates, do we want to reprovision them again or not? So you can check this box if you want to do it. It will depend on your environment. So in this case, I'm assigning VLANs to interfaces. So my uh, variables are the interfaces. And I am assigning the interfaces manually but you can also export and import using a CSV file if you want to do it in bulk. So let me, one quick thing. So this is where all the configuration is going to be pushed uh, at once. The only, uh, the only step that required us to input anything was when we have variables to templates. We can see that all the information from network uh, network settings, I have NTP, I have DHCP, I have DNS. I didn't have to enter all those things. Those are defined in the network settings for my T branch site. Next, you're go you can decide to provision that device. You can do it at that point. You can schedule it for later in a maintenance window. And or you can also generate a config preview. So if you want to see what is being pushed to the device before doing so, you can generate that, conf that configuration preview. So here is where we follow the configuration uh, status. So it's configuring. Eventually, we get a success. And what I want to show you very briefly is that Every single step of this workflow is very clearly documented here. So if anything fails, hopefully not, but if anything fails, here is where you can get all the logs for every single step that happened in this configuration process. So next will be to take a look at the switch. First, when we see the device details, we clearly see utilization for memory and CPU. And then once we go into device details, we get a graphical view of the device. In this case, I have a single, a single switch. I'll show you in a minute a stack of two. That's what I have. Uh, we can run commands directly from here without having to SSH into the device. And this is my interface Gigabit Ethernet 108. That's the one we provisioned in the provision workflow. And we see that we have the VLAN and the uh, description. Having said that, my step here is kind of useless because if I hover into that particular port, I can see that information directly from the UI. And if I click on that port, I can get all the details specifically from that port. Um, I want to show you another port that has actually PoE, so I'll skip this one for a moment. So what I did was assign a VLAN or a uh, description using a template, but there's another way to assign VLANs and descriptions if you want to do it in the, um, in the UI directly. So in this case, we can, uh, we can change or we can add, I should say, an access VLAN and or a voice VLAN and or a description directly from the UI. So you don't need that te a template if you don't want to to perform this action. If you want to do a quick change, you can do it directly from here. So I just changed the access VLAN as well as the description. Next step, I'm going to, again, this is not necessary just to show you. I'm going to go and run the commands and show you interface gigabit uh, 109. And we are going to see the, inf the, the commands that I just pushed using the UI. OK, so now we uh, saw a little bit of the UI for the ports. Uh, we have the full configuration for the switches. We'll talk about config management in my next section, but you have a quick glimpse on the configuration from here. 
A lot of details, we are not going to go into details, but you get power and fans, you can get, um, uh, there you go. You can get power and fans, and then we're going to go in and, and look at a stack. So if you do have a stack, you're going to see the graphical view of each member of the stack in the same way as we saw one. And not only that, in this case, I have a stack with uh, PoE ports. So I'm going to show you in a minute ports that are PoE. This is my upstream port, so we can see the health, the speed, the MTU for every single port. This is to my upstream switch. If you have any PoE ports, you have the power allocated as well as the power drawn for that port as well. So next, I, this is the device 360 is going to be covered by Adam, or assurance is going to be covered by Adam. So I want to show you one other thing in the inventory. Give me a moment. So the other, this is another switch in my, in my lab, and we can see that we have, obviously, all the, um, the color coding for the different port types, but we have also color coding based on VLAN. So I chose another device that has more VLAN, so it's more interesting. So you can choose up to five VLANs to see here, and you have the color coding per, the v, per VLANs that you choose in this particular list. So here, the, here is the tag that says that you can select maximum of five VLANs, and with that, I'm ready to pass it on to Adam. Thanks, Leila. How many people love troubleshooting networks? Anyone? How many people are really good at it, so good that their friends always ask them over to dinner so that they can troubleshoot either their home Wi-Fi or broadband network? Everybody? Yep. I've stopped going. It's not worth it. Um, but the point is that we haven't necessarily made troubleshooting that simple. Uh, what I wanted to do is to touch on a few of the things that we've done around the operational assurance, the day two uh, operations of, of switches. How many people are running prime infrastructure? Yep. How many people have more than 1,000 alarms that they haven't acknowledged or looked at prime infrastructure? Yeah? So the alarming mechanism, the event mechanism, is a traditional network management mechanism that has been problematic because there's lots of data get, that gets generated, but what do you do with it? So DNA Center has a very different approach. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to work on with DNA Center is, is to get away from that problem of lots of events that no one looks at. We still have the events, but we try to create some abstractions on top of them to make it easier for you to see what's going on. Uh, one of the primary abstractions we have is the notion of health. And the reason we did this is that we found that as a network engineer, um, communicating to senior management around whether you're doing a good job or not is actually quite difficult. Because if the network's working fine, they assume that you're at the beach or skiing. But it's only when the network is having a problem that you get any visibility. So the whole idea of health is that most executives can understand three colors, right? Green is good, orange is OK, red is bad, because they drive to work in the morning. So they can kind of get that. So the whole point here is that we've moved to this abstraction called health to make it simpler to explain to people who don't understand networking, whether the network is behaving as you would expect. As I said, we still have this notion of events, but what we've done is we've created issues on top of that, which is things that you need to care about. There might be thousands of events, but there will be a small number of issues that you need to worry about. And then what we do with those issues is we create notifications so that you can find out about it without having to log into the, the DNA Center dashboard to find out what's going on. They can go to a WebEx team space, they can go to email, they can go to PagerDuty. There's a bunch of different things that we've done. So inside the health view, the other thing that we've done is the reason that network troubleshooting is hard typically 
is that there's lots of different pieces of information in different places, and you spend your time correlating those together, right? So the device 360 is a place where everything comes together. So everything that DNAC knows about the device is viewable and accessible from this device 360. So simplistic things like utilization of memory and CPU come up. Uh, we're also able to give you link errors, link discards. We're able to give you events that have occurred at a particular point in time. So when I hover over that moment in time at 4.40 AM, bear in mind that this is Sydney time, uh, you'll see anything that has been happening on the device. You'll see that below there is a list of all of the, uh, an indication of all the events because there's a little green dot. A green dot is a good event, a red dot is a bad event, so you're able to see very quickly if there are things that have happened over the last 24 hours, seven days, etc. You notice that there was a little button that said run commands. This is something that we've added. And it's similar to what Leela showed you before, but it gives you access to the command runner straight off the, the assurance page. So you can dive in and run some commands if you really wanted to do some troubleshooting. The other thing that we've done is we've given you a lot more visibility into PoE. How many people have PoE, PoE devices? How many of you are worried about PoE budgets, devices that have PoE failures? Uh, all of this information is available now. Um, we're giving you access to this PoE dashboard uh, inside the device 360, and you can see the status, and you can see uh, issues as well that are generated if there is PE problems. There is a specific dashboard for PoE holistically across the environment, so it will show you all of the, uh, the PoE status across your entire environment. You can see some insights into you know, what types of PoE you're running. You can see insights into availability. And you can also see some insights into usage that we've extended now to include both the base device as well as the PoE component, because the core switch has some PoE requirements or has some power requirements. And then the PoE is on top of that. But we've integrated those together now. Uh, the way that this data is available is through telemetry connections. So we're moving away from polling towards telemetry, which is a stream of data from the device into DNA Center. In later versions of IOXE, there are about 20 different streams that are coming into DNA Center from the device. And it's a far more efficient way of us finding out information around what's going on, because we don't have to worry about polling intervals. You do need to have NetConfyang enabled to do this. And in most of the, well, in the later versions of iOS, it gets enabled uh, by DNA Center. In terms of events, we show you and give you access to the events. So there's an event viewer that we have in uh, 2.3.4 and 2.3.3. So you can see all of the events that are happening in the network if you want to, much the same way that you could see them in Prime. So this is something that we've added. You can filter them. You can look at what's going on. You still have access to them. Uh, in the latest version of code, we give you access to events generated by clients. So if you've got .1x issues, you'll be able to see some of those events come in. If you've got DHCP issues, you'll see some of those events coming in. So there's more visibility that we give you there. But we don't necessarily want you to, to focus on the event piece. We want you to focus on the abstraction, which is this concept of an issue. So what is an issue? An issue is based on an event or a series of events or other metrics. So for example, it could be CPU and memory. If they exceed certain thresholds, that will generate an issue. The other thing that we may do is that we may have a certain number of events that occur in a period of time will generate an issue. Because if I just see one of them, I don't really care. If I see multiple of them in a set period of time, that's where I typically worry. They can be global or local to the device or user, so there are some um, issues that we generate that are local, uh, just to the device. It's something that is relative to that device only. But then there are sometimes global issues um, that we, we populate up and we give you visibility of globally. So you can customize these issues. You can customize the severity of them. You can customize the, the trigger. You can customize the, the location. So you're able to do, make these changes on a per location basis. And the other way that we are increasingly generating these events is via AI tools. Why do we do that? Well, if you think about traditional threshold-based events, it doesn't matter what threshold you choose. It's either too high or too low, right? 
If it's too high, you don't get enough. If it's too low, you get too many events or issues. So with AI tools, we're able to look at what the baseline is, time of day, day of week, and then we're able to look at what the variation is or deviation from normal behavior is. So you would expect something like onboarding time might be higher on a Monday morning compared to a Friday afternoon, and you can take that into account. Uh, the other thing that we are increasingly doing with these issues is we're using tools like Machine Reasoning Engine to automatically evaluate a root cause. So in this case, an issue was generated around a link between two devices going down. You run a root cause analysis, and it's because someone had shut down administratively one side of the link. So able to pick that up and tell you how to remediate it. Uh, this is just for reference. There are about 60, there are about, there are 63 switching issues. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there will be a test on it when you leave the room. I'm just joking. Uh, something we've added in 235 is the ability to define a custom issue. So if there's a syslog message that we don't take into account that you're interested in, you can turn that into a custom issue. You have the ability to uh, define the number of occurrences and the duration. So if I see three CDP mismatches um, over uh, five minutes, then I can trigger an issue based on those events and change the priority, et cetera. Uh, I mentioned notifications. There are a bunch of different ways that you can take these issues and send them off to do something about it rather than needing to log into the user interface. You can do email, PagerDuty, REST API, which is just a webhook, syslog, and WebEx. SNMP is a bit of a furphy because there's only a very small number of issues that actually support SNMP traps. I'm not going to go into the details as to why that's the case. It's an architectural decision. But uh, you can get those, those issues off. And then finally, um, increasingly, we're moving towards these AI tools for visualization. The first one that we've added for switches is to be able to get heat maps of the temperature of switching devices. So this will give you historical information, and the heat map will show you, you know, what the temperature was across devices over a period of time. And therefore, you can start to see trends and changes across your environment in terms of temperature, if that's something that you're worried about. Expect us to add more of these in the future, but that's the first phase of, of adding some of the AI tooling into the switching infrastructure. And with that, I'll hand back to Leela to finish us off. Sorry, I was answering questions in there. I will do that. Yes, sounds good. Uh, yeah. Two? Five. Yeah. So Adam likes to add this, uh, ask this question, so now it's my turn to ask it. How many of you like upgrading your switches? How many of you really enjoy going in and saying, we need a maintenance window and upgrade switches? How many of you like upgrading your phones, actually? You like it? <laughs> I don't even like upgrading my phone. I say, oh, what's going to happen? So anyway, uh, we are going to talk about day end, so activities that are happening after we do everything that we talked about. And with that, I'm going to cover software and image management. I'm going to cover compliance. RMA and device configuration management. So in this case for SWIM, I'm going to go in and go directly with uh, Devo. The software upgrade process is based on what we call the golden image. Golden image is a, an image version that we select for a device type in a portion of the network. So again, everything is based on a site. So the golden image is going to be per device type, per site. And we have a lot more granularity based on device role. We can use tags, so a lot of granularity there. In order to tag a device with golden image, we first need to download the image. So in this case, we get the option of downloading it directly from here. And in this demo, I am going to upgrade multiple switches at a time. I wish I can tell you I would do 100. But I don't have 100 switches in my lab. I, I have four, so I'm going to upgrade four switches at once. Uh, so at least it shows the capability of doing this in bulk, because this is the real value of SWIM. So in this case, we need to wait for the image to download. 
when the image finally downloads into the database, into the internal database, DNA Center is going to do a checksum of the image. So we need to make sure that anything that we import in our repository is valid, it hasn't been tampered with, and for that we use a file that is called known good values that DNA Center automatically downloads from, uh, from Cisco.com. You can actually download it manually if you want or if you're in an air gap environment, but if not, it's done automatically whenever they, periodically and whenever there's a new version. So once the image has been downloaded and all the checks has been done, this is where we can tag the image as golden. And again, we are going to do that for my 9200L switches and also for my 9300. Those are the devices that I'm going to upgrade. In both cases, I'm going to use um, 17.92 version. In my case, I'm tagging the golden image for the whole site, but as I mentioned before, you can decide to have a different image for a 9300 in the access and an, a different image if you have a 9300 in the core. So now that I have my golden images, this is telling me, okay, you need to upgrade all these devices. So it's showing me, so this is actually filtering automatically into the devices that need to be upgraded. You don't need to maintain a spreadsheet or anything with your device upgrade process. Everything is filtered here. Uh, the needs update is a hyperlink that actually shows us a few of the pre-checks that we do. These are kind of the basic pre-checks. Is there enough uh, space in Flash? Is the config register already there? Or is there a startup config um, in place and matches the running config? So we need to have all these things in place to have a successful software upgrade. Then you will be able to define your own checks, and I'll show you that in a minute. But those are the basic checks. So now I'm going to go in and upgrade all my four Cat 9K, and I'm going to go through the workflow. Yes, this is a switching session, but the same workflow is valid for routers, for wireless LAN controllers, for, uh, for the access point, so everything is completely matching. Next step is to, let me backtrack this advance a little bit. So next step is to go through the workflow. DNA Center has two steps, two main steps. One is the distribution, which is copying the image in Flash, and a few other things, but in essence, that's the bulk of the action, and then the activation. We are separating both because it depends on your infrastructure. In a lot of cases, we do require a maintenance window for the distribution. In a lot of cases, we don't. We do require a maintenance window for the activation because obviously we are reloading the device. So in, in my demo, I'm going to do it as separate stages because that's how our customers mostly use SWIM. They do it at different stages. For both, you can define your own pre-checks and post-checks, and I'm going to add, I'm going to show you how to add a pre-check and post-check. I showed you before the command runner, and everything that can run in the command runner is valid as a pre as post-check. So the best way to do it is to run the command runner from here, make sure that the command is valid, and then I just copy and paste it in the here in the little window of the pre-checks. In my case, this is just a show IP interface brief. In, the, in my example, I'm going to skip activation because I'm going to do it in the next step. We can schedule the distribution and the activation, but in this case, I'm going to do it now. And also, let me go to the next step. And here we have our, all our switches all at once and we are going to submit it now. So once we submit, what this is doing is copying the image in Flash. How many of you have switches with install mode in the devices? So we have two ways of booting up or dealing with software images. One is bundle mode. Bundle mode is the binary file. It's kind of the older way of doing things. So we copy the binary file. The binary file stays in flash. And when you boot up the device, that binary file needs to open up. So it takes more time. And we move towards a model that is called install mode. And the install mode is the recommended mode. So if you're not using install mode, you might want to go that way. And 
if you have install mode, we have a lot of efficiencies in place with DNAC that allows you to do more things in the distribution phase and do less things in the activation. Again, activation is maintenance window, so we want to make it as short as possible. So all this is happening in the background. So I'm going to go in and check the image status update. We have a very comprehensive view, similar to what I showed you before with the logs. So we have a very comprehensive view. I also have, you will, most likely you will not have access to console of every device that you upgrade, but I want to show you all the commands that are being pushed by DNA Center. Now that this is finished and it doesn't take that short, that's why I'm doing a video, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, we can see the pre-checks and post-check here, and we have here an indication whether or not there are differences. In our case, there are no differences. Again, we just copy the image in Flash, and we, uh, we open up that binary file, so that's the only thing we did. Now we are ready to go in and do, let's assume that we are in the maintenance window, so we are going to go in and do the activation for those same switches. So once we do the activation, in this case I selected everything, but I'm going to skip my CAT3K that I have there. I don't want to upgrade it now, so that's another way of using this workflow that I wanted to show you. We can see that DNA Center automatically uh, skipped the distribution. It knows that we already distributed the image, so we go directly to activation. Here, same as before, we have the option of turning on and off all the pre-checks and post-checks. In my case, I'm going to turn off stuff, again, just to show you that you can do that. We can see that this has, distribution has been done, and same as before, we can schedule the activation, we can do it now, and we also have integration with ServiceNow. Um, and I'm not going to cover that today, but we can talk about that offline. So now I'm going to kick off the network update. And when this is done, we are going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to go in and check the checks. We see all the devices that have been successfully upgraded. My 9200L switch, one of those, and this is a check. So now that we look at the check, we see that there are some differences. So in that case, we can go and take a peek. In most cases, it's a timer that is different. So since the, only the timer is different, life is good for me, and I can feel comfortable that I had a successful software upgrade. Now, I left you a lot of for everything. So once you get access to the presentation, both Adam and I left a lot of reference slides. I forgot to mention that, so get a hold of those slides. So we talked about software upgrade. Now we are ready to talk about RMA. So RMA means replacing a device that failed. No, we are not, DNA Center is not dealing with the actual shipment of the device and all that stuff. This is about the technical replacement in your network. In general, when we think about replacing a device, we think about configuration. Grabbing the config from the device that failed and putting it in the new device. That's good, we take care of that, but we take things a step further. We want to give you the whole workflow, and that includes obviously anything within DNA Center. It includes the software version. We want to make sure we match the same software version that you had in the failed device if it's different. We take care of the licensing for, obviously this is for smart licensing, not for um, traditional licensing. If you have the device in ICE, this is going to be replaced too, and we are going to ex revoke and add the new certificates because we have a new device. So it's the whole workflow for RMA. So how will this work? You have a device that failed, so this device failed here. We are going to get the new device after we did all the work with TAC. The device had to be matching, so it's a like-to-like -like replacement. And the recommendation is that you take the uplink, uh, the, the same uplink and the same port the same cable from the failed device to the new device. In the lab, that's not required, but in production, that saves a lot of time because you don't need to make any changes of configuration in the upstream switch. You just change it to the new switch. There's nothing that we need to do. In the back end, we are using a similar 
capability as Adam talked about with PNP. So the device is a new device, has no configuration whatsoever. Once we power up the device, this device is going to register into DNA Center. DNA Center will not know what to do, and it's going to show up as an unclaimed device. So when the device shows up as unclaimed, it becomes a candidate for RMA. So what this is saying is that this device number two failed. We marked it as replacement. So we say this failed. We want to replace this device. And then it's giving me a list. Well, my list has one, but let, you might have more. It can give you a list of devices that are candidates for replacement. I'm going to choose this switch. In this case, it's like switch number two. So this one here is the failed one. And this one is going to be my second one. And once I do that, DNA Center is going to grab all the details from switch number one, including the image version, as well as the config. And it's going to be pushing it to the replacement device. So what are the technical considerations? I mentioned that already. I don't know if it's here. Yes, they like to like, so it has to be the same PID. Otherwise, the device is not going to show up as a candidate for replacement. The, all the workflow that I showed you is the zero touch RMA, meaning that the, co the device has no configuration whatsoever. But if you want to grab a device, put an IP address, discover the device, no provisioning. It has to be unprovisioned. That's also an option for replacement, if you want to do it that way. And we call it one touch because you are putting an IP address to the device and discovering it in DNA Center. Then the um, configuration replacement. How many of you think that DNA Center doesn't have the latest config of the device? And it's a valid. I hear that question a lot. So when was the last time you collected the config? Oh, no hands up. I'm so happy about that. DNA Center has always the latest config of the device. At one point, we were a little bit late in showing the latest config, and I will show you how to do it. But we always store the latest config in the device. We grab the config in the device when we do that inventory collection that I mentioned at the beginning. We also grab the config periodically. We have a resync interval there. And I already mentioned, if we do have our SNMP traps enabled as DNA Center device controllability, anytime there's a change in the device, DNA Center will get a notification via the SNMP traps. And DNA Center is going to go in and grab the new configuration and store it into the internal databases. All this to say that we will take always the latest config for device replacement. That's the one that we are going to be pushing to the new device. A million reference slides. I love my reference slides. Next, it's going to be compliance. How many of you are interested in compliance? You have to raise the hand. I get this question all the time. OK. This is my favorite topic, I should say. So we are, I hate this word, and I use this word all the time. But anyway, we're in a journey for compliance. And we've, been, we've come a long way. We have a lot of stuff currently in, um, from a compliance perspective. Let me see. I'm, I think I'm going to go through a demo directly. Yes, because I want to show you a few things. So let me go into a demo. This is all we have from a slide perspective from a switch perspective, I should say. And then let's go into the, the compliance demo. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provoke, I'm going to cause a compliance violation. So in this case, you saw in the demo before how I pushed a template and a VLAN into an interface. This is my interface 108. And also, I have the network settings. So in my network settings, I pushed a name server, actually two, two name server IP addresses. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in offline, assuming I'm a network admin. I'm SSHing. I think I'm SSHing here, or console. And I'm going to go in and remove all these configurations. So I'm removing configuration that I push from a template, and I'm removing configuration that I push from a network profile. So remember these two things. 
So there I have no VLAN uh, defined, I have no description, I have no name servers anymore. So now I'm going to go into my compliance check. The one thing if you want to try this in the lab is that you will not see the compliance violation right away. So we do send the Give me a sec. We do send the trap. We, re we do reread the configuration, but we have a hold timer of five minutes to make sure that there are no other changes. So if you're doing this in the lab, wait the five minutes. Or you can do like me, like start clicking compliance check, compliance check. I'm impatient, so I do it a million times. Go and grab a coffee and then come back. Uh, better use of your time. Anyway, so this is what we see here. We see a few things. We see network settings, compliance violation, we see network profile, and we see startup versus running. What is this saying is the network settings don't match. There is something wrong there. The network, uh, the network profile, which is the template, the bucket for the template, also has a problem. And there is a difference between startup and running. When I made that change, I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't save the running config. So this is saying, hey, if the, re if the device reboots on its own, it's going to use a different version from what's running right now. So that's a problem. And that is also flagged as a compliance violation. So we can go in and, and let, take a look at the open violations. And we can clearly see my two DNS servers that I removed. I can go in and take a, take a look at the network profile with my two compliance violations here. So we can see that uh, it shows me the, uh, the name of the templates that are in trouble, VLAN 419. It shows me the line. So a line that is highlighted in red means a line that is missing. It should have been there, but it's missing. Someone removed it. Maybe it was me, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. And then uh, same thing with the description. It means there's a problem with this template, and this is the line that was removed. The other tool, the other tool that it's not specifically compliance, but it's related to compliance, it's config drift. So config drift is going to go in and show me exactly the change. As I said before, we always, so do we have the latest config, yes or no? Yes, thank you. But we also have 15, actually 15, 14 plus one, so the 15 latest config we store. We not only can store those configs, but we can compare those configs. And not only we can compare those configs, we can name, put a name in one of those configs, or many, but most likely in one. So if you have one standard config or a config that you want to compare to, you can always keep it with a name, so it's going to be stored and it's not going to be removed when we rotate. So in this case, what happened? Here, it's when it's a, um, what is this? A purple button, this means an out of band config drift. What this is saying is someone went out of band, someone with a username netadmin, it doesn't say Lila, so I don't know. Someone went in and removed three lines. Remember that I removed the three lines, and here it's telling me what are the three lines. So in this case, it's comparing the current config with the latest running config, and it's saying, hey, this command is not there, which is the name server, and these two commands are not there, which is the VLAN and the description. So those are the three commands that I changed. So this tool goes really well with compliance, even though it's not the compliance tool. OK, so let's go back to my, no, let's go back now where I'm go, I mentioned that we can label a config. So let's say that the config on the left is the one that we like. We can actually put a name in that config. So instead of comparing to the latest conf com config, we can compare to that config. So here it says we are saving 15 config drift, and currently we have one that is uh, named. OK, we have all these problems. How are we going to fix this situation? So there is an option to fix all configuration compliance violations here. And these are the ones that are referring to configuration. As we can see, we have, can I see it here? No. We have other compliance violations like software upgrades. So if you have a device that doesn't have a golden image, it's going to show up here. This fix is not going to fix that. This fix is going to fix. Uh, 
uh, running config and startup config, network profile, network settings, so anything that has to do with config. So it's showing here all the stuff that it's going to be fixed. Same as before, we can run it now, we can run it later, we can generate a preview. I'm going to go ahead and run it now. This also takes a little bit of time, so we need to wait. Or we, I could have advanced the video. It's going to fix all the compliance. If you want to fix, you can go in and reprovision the device and decide what you want to fix. But that one is going to fix all, though. No, that's OK. So I'm just doing the show command. I feel that no one believes me if I don't show this. You can put in the comments if I need to do this in other or you believe me that it's there. So what I'm showing is now the template is there and the name server is there too. OK, so the last topic that I want to cover is, again, my reference there, is configuration management. So configuration management is, in a way, is how to get the configuration from the switches so that I can restore other devices. When, when we were doing the demo, I did show you that in the switches inventory, so when you go into the device details, there's a column that is called configuration. So you can see the latest configuration there. However, all the, all the sensitive commands, like the certificates and the passwords, or I'll, they are all masked. So you're going to see things like that. So if you want to grab that configuration and put it in a new device or in another device, that's not going to work. That's going to fail. So what happens, so this is good for you to go in and check quickly the config, all that is good, but not if you want to get the actually raw config to put it in, a new, in another device. So if we want to do that, one way to do it is using APIs. I usually leave the APIs at the end, but now I'm talking about APIs a little bit before that. We can retrieve the raw configuration using the API that, we, um, that I show here. And this is going to give us a zip file that is going to have the, running config, the raw running config, startup config, and the VLAN database. If you are not a fan of using the APIs, we can use the UI. So there is an option in the system settings where you can configure an external SFTP server. And there is a lot of granularity here, so you can decide the, the cycle, so how often you want to have the backups, of what location, so again, you define the sites that you want to do the backups. If you want to have the mass configuration or the raw, we are assuming we want the raw. And we need to decide a username and password. And I'll explain that why. So the reason we, are, we were masking the sensitive data is because, for security reasons, it's because it's sensitive. So in this case, in order to protect that sensitivity, what we are sending to the SFTP server is a zip file. And the moment you want to open that zip file, you need to enter the password that you defined in the settings. Once you open up that zip file, you are going to get a directory per device that you are backing up. And once again, what do we get inside the directory? The running, the startup, and the VLAN database. The last thing, and I'm shameless because I'm advertising my own blogs, but hopefully that's OK. So one other thing that we can do in DNA Center, how many of you are looking into Thousand Eyes? So Thousand Eyes can be run in different ways, but it can also run in a Catalyst 9300 and 9400 in Flash, and you can get most of the tests. What has DNA Center has to do with anything? Two things. First, with, the, with DNA Center, we can automate the deployment of the Thousand Eyes Enterprise Agent in your switches. If you have three agents, you can do it manually, all good. But let's say that you want to do it in 100 switches. DNA Center can very fast 
deploy those agents in your switches. Not only that, there is some integration from an application visibility where you can get in the applications tab, you can get a summary of all the tests that you are running from those switches that you install with DNA Center. So the information that you get, again, is a summary. If you want to get more detailed information, we click on the link and we can cross-launch into the Thousand Eyes dashboard. I wrote a ton of emails, including how to install, how to install with DNA Center manually. If you're interested, go and check it out. So in conclusion, as Adam said, we talk a lot about DNA Center in the wireless environment, because again, wireless is difficult to troubleshoot, so it's very interesting. But we have a ton of things to do in the switching infrastructure, and that is what we wanted to share with you today. It's not comprehensive. We needed to have one and a half hours. We didn't have more. If they had given us four hours, we could have done that too. And with that, we want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for attending more sessions on DNA Center. If you are so kind to, I know everyone is asking you the same, but to complete the survey, it means a lot to us. We are so proud that you chose our sessions. And if you can reflect that in the surveys, we'll be very grateful. The WebEx space is open for questions. It's open until, I don't know, whenever they say it's open, you'll know. And we are here if you have any other questions for that. And with that, enjoy the rest of the Cisco Live.